I am very happy to be here for what's the uh, second installment of, uh, on the topic of vaccines. We were here in January. I just have to share a, a quick story. Um, Gary Olson sent an email saying, what floor uh, is this meeting on? And I responded, um, uh, officially through Cynthia and then on my own through my own company. <coughs> reached out to him and said, hey, who are you and let's get together. So over a cup of tea, suddenly we realized that we were you know, inches apart, I guess, in our universes, and that we know a lot of the same people and uh, have been in the same industry. So the moral of the story is answer those emails, because you never know who your next presenter might be. And uh, <laughs> Carrie, I'm so glad that uh, we met and that uh, you're, you're taking this opportunity to take the second installment of IP video and share it with all of the folks here to dispel um, some of the buzzwords that are out there and put some understanding behind so we are going to start off with a uh, overview from Fred Huffman, and I'd like to invite Fred up. Fred, come on up. Thank you. Thanks, John. First of all, thank you, Cisco, for hosting us again. We're uh, really lucky to have uh, this kind of resource to be able to support um, our work. I have a little bit of a Gary story too, to the extent that shortly after the first meeting we had here in January, I don't know how I found your name, Gary, but I remember just picking up the phone and calling you. It was kind of surprised and very pleased to hear you answer your phone. <laughs> and we spent probably the next hour to an hour and a half uh, talking a little bit about the meeting we just had, what we'd observed, and can you hear me okay yeah. now? Yeah. And then, uh, made, kind of, a, uh, we did agree that the subject at hand was much deeper and much broader <coughs> than what we've seen and heard in the January meeting. It's still that way, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're here tonight. And what kind of came out of that conversation was uh, an approach to, okay, what do we do uh, for the next meeting? And the first thing was, of course, is to try to get it on a schedule. But content-wise, I think we both agreed that one of the things that was sorely needed was some kind of an approach to doing a little bit of uh, education on terms and terminology. This terminology issues are, are big issues, and it's much broader than just simply um, across computer communications and, and other electronic industries. Uh, the kind of thing I think of is uh, you will be in a meeting, maybe like this, you hear a presentation, and then there's a discussion that kind of starts with questions or answers, and the next thing you know you have all these uh, conversations that are not really conversations, but what they are are uh, one-way uh, uh, talks, I suppose, without very much listening. And people wind up going away having heard such things as uh, one term to have different meanings and two different terms to mean the same thing. So, so there's a lot of incoherence and confusion post a lot of these meetings. And real education and real communication um, has a long way to go and a lot to do, and that's one of the things that we hope to, to do tonight is to uh, begin to uh, clear up some of the terms, terminology, and this thing I call buzzwords. Uh, I've done some looking into, into Gary's background and was talking to him a little bit earlier, but like a lot of us, he's been around for a while. He's got more hair than I do. Um, but it's about the same level of grade. And if you uh, poke around a little bit, you'll find out he, uh, I'm not sure he want this mentioned too loudly or too widely, but he was involved in some of the early uh, teletext development. I guess you all know what teletext is or was. Uh, anyway, uh, he's also worked on a wide variety of uh, projects, programs, and so forth that deal all the way from business kinds of issues to some of the 
deeper uh, technical uh, things that we all have to deal with once in a while. So I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to hear what he has to say and to present. And I won't promise you that there may not be controversy come out of it <laughs> to the extent that uh, one of the things we've learned over the last month or two of planning for this is that we don't always agree on a particular term or a buzzword. But I think Gary will uh, help us to begin to close some of the gaps that exist and it will be a very valuable uh, session. So uh, thank you again, Cisco. Welcome, Gary. And What Fred said is a lie. <laughs> uh, I was there when you were doing the technical thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so there are three people in the room that know me and everybody else. Uh, I'm Gary Olson, and uh, tonight I think I'm just going to be a troublemaker. <laughs> so uh, IP is great, intellectual property. Uh, I lost it, so intellectual property, idiot proof, important person. Internet protocol, or somewhere in the middle, we've adopted the term IP to become the computer-centric discussion of the changes in the broadcast industry. When we talk about SDI, we don't really mean video. We really mean the entire spectrum of audio, video, communications, everything that became enveloped as we went from analog to digital. And I think IP, and this is the controversy that Fred is talking about, is, I can turn it off, um, is that we look at it as either a word, a couple of initials that started out as something completely different, or an adoption of a new technology in a way that has been more disruptive than any other technology changes that's existed in the broadcast industry. And at the same time, it's a mature technology that exists someplace else. So I'm going to see if I can uh, lie a little bit. And as far as the buzzword thing goes, that was John's fault. He came up with the title. So I claim no pride of ownership there. But Kleenex is a facial tissue. Xerox is a copy machine. Mm -hmm. I did the IP thing. Buzzwords are things that we make up or we pick up to either confuse others or at the same time to just make it easier to have a conversation. And we all know that you can have a conversation with three letters and three numbers and never say an English word, and the person talking, you're talking with will understand everything you're saying. Maybe now that we're talking between the computer world and the broadcast world, those things don't work so good. So. I think really what I'm here to do is maybe, I wouldn't say debunk any myths, but if we hit a couple along the way, it won't be so bad. Um, I'm going to break this up a little bit so anybody that's falls asleep or wants to leave will give everybody opportunity to do that. But there's a beginning to end, and where this really started, um, January, is that in all industries, it's really the vendors that drive things, but at the same time, it's the end users that need things. But from a vendor perspective, and what I won't be doing tonight, no bits, spice, speeds, feeds, G's, and K's. So we're not going to be talking about how fast it goes. We're not going to be talking the quality of resolution. It's really about the whole food chain, and I wrote the book on it. <laughs> Shameless plug, moving on. <laughs> discount code. <laughs> Special discount. <laughs> so, stack. Oh, what a great word. Oh, my goodness. So, stack is a buzzword. It's really not. But, I mean, you know, we've adopted the word stack to buy so many things. We have open stacks, um, we have a supply chain. 
Well, the supply chain used to be what FedEx and the logistics business handled when you were getting the delivery from one place to another. Now the supply chain is the entire media architecture, getting it from acquisition all the way through delivery. A pancake is a stack. I mean, we all go pancakes, right? Get stacks, they're great. Um, so the stack, as I'm going to affectionately say, breaks down into all the pieces of what the, the entire media ecosystem is. So we have acquisition. And acquisition has broken down and all of the world of IP or computer-centric broadcast breaks into servers, storage, devices, network applications. And no matter what you're doing, whether it's acquisition, contribution, ingest, production, archive, distribution, or delivery, it all uses that stuff. So, and then we have things that sit on top of it. So we have command and control. We have new things called metadata. Not really new, but maybe so much. Um, software and hardware are the same. It's commodity-based. And then we have standards and protocols. And I do this badly, but I think a protocol is a polite suggestion of a good idea, and a standard is the way that things are supposed to be done based upon an agreement in the industry of people that make up those kind of things. So if we move on, and that, uh, we move on, oops, sorry, there we go. So now if we start to take apart each of the layers in the stack, this just, this just doesn't work. Too many things. So we have acquisition. So we have studio acquisition, and in studio acquisition, we have the regular cameras and stuff like that, but then we have things that are, we have computer-based editing, we have computer-based graphics, we have all of the things that happen in there. Um, I have to do this because like everybody hates when I do this, SDHD, so, <laughs> um, removable storage, so all kinds of different media. Well, we used to have beta tapes and then three-quarter tapes and other kind of tapes. Now we have SD, HDDs, we have opticals, we have all kinds of different removable medias, and in the uh, studio world or in the broadcast facility world, you have one set. But when you go out into the field, the world changes. Because now, are you encoding in the field? Are you taking the disks out of an EBS, putting it into a Halliburton and having somebody get a limo to the airport? Are you transporting it over a network? Is it FTP? I mean, how are you getting it from the field? Or is it a remote, a little remote, not a big remote? And how many times do you send somebody to the nearest Best Buy to get a new set of chips because you didn't bring enough with you? Or having somebody quickly dump off of the SSDs because you kind of overshot and now you've got to be dumping them in real time. So acquisition is a whole new world. It's not just a camera into a tape deck, out of the tape deck, across into a uh, editing system and off to the races. So media happens in many different ways and it happens from many different devices and types of devices. Um, and then we go to contribution. Well, contribution, as Fred said, is where he and I don't necessarily see eye to eye all the time, but we agree that contribution is basically getting it from the outside and bringing it to the inside. And there we have networks. But is it, do you encode in the field and then ship it back? Do you send it back as SDI and then encode when it gets in? There's a lot of different decisions that you make as part of contribution, and all of this as it falls into the world of IP is that it's network-centric, it's service-centric, it's application-centric. Now we come into the house and we're ingesting something. So we're encoding it, we're registering it into a MAM, are we transcoding it, we're entering metadata or not, and most of the time not so that somebody down the road yells at you because they opened something up and didn't know what it was, or it's got a really long file name. Because if you put it all in the file name, then you never have to really enter the metadata into the uh, actual media. So 
production has its own set of technologies. And again, it's a broader spectrum of technologies. And this is where mm, I get in more trouble because in the <coughs> ecosystem of the world, I argue that we're 90% IP and 10% owns the conversation because at IBC, I think we saw IP out of a camera and into a production switch and maybe some transition switching. But live owns the last 10%, maybe even 5%, but it owns 90% of the conversation. All of these things, by the way, are just linked together by a network. And where we used to have automation in master control, now we have orchestration. So what's orchestration? Orchestration is uh, automation on steroids. Automation that begins with all of the processes from the acquisition side that handles file movement, that triggers an encoding process, that tells something to happen for the next thing to happen. And orchestration and automation and command and control in the computer-centric world is a overarching umbrella of an application that handles all the different activities of all the different devices and all the different systems that need to talk to each other and need to move either live or file-based media. And then as we need rules and regulations, we have the standards and the protocols of the different organizations, the ISO, and we have a lot of different efforts being made by everybody to come up with what used to be video out to video in. There's no such thing as IP out to IP in. So we need to have the conversation that standards that move media back and forth. MXF came along so that we had files to talk to each other, sort of. Um, and then we move through the line. So archiving. Archiving used to be take the tape, put it on a shelf, type the shelf number in a computer, off to the races, make sure that the yellow pad is stapled to the top of the box. Now we don't do that anymore. Now we register a file. Now in addition to archiving it, we have a little version, proxy. And so everything has changed. Distribution. Distribution used to go over the air, then it went over the cable, then over the satellite. Now it goes to a box, it goes to a DVR, it goes to a cell service, it goes to every platform that exists, and even within the platforms themselves, there's different flavors for every platform. Because everybody's got the same phone, right? You all have a uh, Apple? Blackberry. Maybe. No. Well, Blackberry not does nothing. And he's a ringer. So when I talk about the whole stack, I think the conversation just becomes IP is, in my mind, everything. And I had to do this. So, you know, we went from a tape-based system where tape and baseband was everything. And then we went to digital stuff. And then we got here. So it was a process of getting there. And one of the things that we all know is that every time we change technology, we went through with forklifts, we went through with bulldozers, we cleared out all the old technology, threw it all out, big dumpsters, and replaced it with new technology. Right? Not one. No, maybe not. So I have to do this. So we have IP as islands and a vast sea of SDI in all the broadcast facilities. So we have little bits of IP. We don't edit on computers. We don't transfer files. We're not backhauling streams into broadcast centers. I think I'm making all this up, right? Yeah, yeah. You're from the major network. Cool. So I had to do this. Sorry. It was uh, the vast sea of SDI. <coughs> I'm kind of thinking that maybe with a little bit of global warming, that the erosion of SDI is being completely overtaken by a sea of IP with some cloudy stuff raining down media from the <laughs> vast above. So what's the difference between IP and SDI? Well, 
uh, SDI was all about proprietary stuff and tape machines that did nothing but what video stuff, video and audio stuff. Now it's a computer. It's a commodity. It's just it's running an application on a the same thing that does word processing or does an Excel spreadsheet. So I think the big transition is going from a proprietary centric place into a commodity based place. However, with specialized applications, with specialized cards, with you know specialized things that do things, but integrated in a way that they've never been integrated before. And I think that's the big thing with IP technology is that it's integrated in a way that it's never been integrated before. But not when the legal guy calls you up and says, I can't get into the asset manager because I've got to put the contract rules in there so that the expiration is attached before it gets out of the door. In SDI, I think that was an email with a document that got stapled to something, then it left the house. So the rules change. So it's all different. And that's what I think the thing is all about, is that IP is all different, and everybody's got an end-to-end -end solution. Nobody's got a beginning-to-end solution. It's all about integrated and interoperable. Oh, those are horrible words. So, we have essence, we have acquisition, we transition from SDI to IP. We're within the IP space as we go from our acquisition to transport to production. Inside we have a little bit of both because the camera thing, live thing, we're, we're getting there but we're not quite there yet. Then we go back to IP and we're IP all the way. So there's a beginning to end and while kind of was struggling over this because with all of the consolidation in the industry, there's only four manufacturers left, or four holding companies left. So there might really be an end-to-end -end solution, but again, if nobody's throwing out everything and they have to buy a box here or a box there, then maybe we have to integrate a lot of different things interoperably until we can actually go with that one manufacturer that owns all the other companies. So. I have to do this. So, <laughs> IP. Is it a camera? Is it a second screen? Is it both? So, IP means you get both. Two for the price of one. Okay, break time. My question, somewhere back in one of the slides, I mentioned something about a new control stack. Anybody paying attention? Very close. There you go, orchestration. We have a winner? We do. Right back here. Look at that. There you go. Look at that. So now, I get to answer a question. Or not? I can keep going. I have lots of stuff. Okay. Oh, sorry. Is there any entity in that sort of designing this? Is there any is there any entity looking at this and, and coming up with some sort of design and working with the vendors and working with the minds that are discussing what you're discussing? <laughs> uh, or is it just sort of like consortium <laughs> like this that are discussing to get there? Well, I mean they're practitioners. I mean I'm a practitioner. Um, and I have a colleague in the room who is in the middle of building one. And there's a guy from Fox on the West Coast who will tell you that he built one. And ESPN D2 did it. I actually uh, do that. Um, I did it at the UN. I did it for the NBA. I mean, the answer to your question is that, it, again, it's, it's integrating things. And it's forums like this which provide education, knowledge, or direction on how to find information so that you understand how to do the integration. I mean, manufacturers all tell you that they play nicely in the sandbox with others as long as it's another one of their sister companies and not so much the guy across the aisle. Sorry, I know there's a lot of guys in here. Um, but 
you know, the manufacturers focus on their products and they want their products to be stable, mature, and to do these things. But putting them all together, it's always, I mean, integrators, I mean, that's what integrators do. And, you know, they have to stay on top of it like everybody else. But, you know, you rely on integrators, you rely on, you know, design teams who come in and put it all together. And then, you know, Hopefully, if you're running one of those teams, you bring the manufacturers in, tell them what your use case is, and then hopefully they can come up with a working solution. Because the other thing is, is that one size doesn't fit all. Hold a second. Just a reminder, we are webcasting and recording this, so it's good for us to get the questions as well. I'm sorry. Just a little note on that. It feels like a wild practitioner. As a practitioner, it feels like a wild product. And I was just, uh, I just wonder sometimes, like, is there is there a fire department? Is there, is there <laughs> or is it just, it isn't just wildfire. Well, if I asked how many people in this room would be willing to raise their hand <laughs> and take ownership of being a firefighter, <laughs> that we could get a bunch of them. There you are. <laughs> the one. We got a couple over there. I know that we got a couple over here or bashful. Anybody else? I just have a comment. Okay. That, um, Here's the mic, sir. Sure. Just a comment that when, uh, if you do get your facility where you're trying to do an integrated IP type thing, such as I'm at the Weather Channel in the operations end, but we went to a uh, delete based system. When the vendor says it takes at least six months to get the system ready to use, Believe them. <laughs> or if it's like a contractor and you do in your kitchen, it's really 12 months. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, uh, somewhere in the somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but that but that's an important thing because we ran into uh, uh, issues where the uh, implementation was accelerated, and it was hell for at least a year. Well, I mean, but now things are working pretty darn well. Can you say why it was so difficult? Uh, yeah, I can say a few things on it. Um, you're, you're working on a system where you've got one vendor who makes, uh, like for us, it was at the let media asset management, and now we're also, and uh, play out, ingest, and now we're using the newsroom computer system. Uh, harmonic servers. Um, and what ends up happening is that everything has to talk exact to each, to each other to interoperate, and uh, you also have to customize it to your specific needs. It's not like uh, the old days where you dropped in a routing switcher and you plugged in your gazimses and your gazadas and, and it just did what it did and all you had to uh, customize was what you call things. You know, this cross point is called this, what have you. Now you've got to set it up so that you've got oodles and oodles of special configurations. You need the vendor to do a lot of it with you if it's this kind of a system and you're dealing with disparate vendor hardware going into it, and uh, okay, so now you get uh, somebody decides, hey, Harmonic just sent that up upgraded uh, firmware for these servers, let's pop them in. Then the whole system breaks, yeah, because you know the, the control system isn't doing it yet. So there's a lot that goes on on this, and um, it also makes, uh, <laughs> Going with uh, Avid look really nice sometimes. <laughs> 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 Very interesting. Not to mention me. Yeah. Well, so, what's the alternative? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the biggest problems we have in facilities is finding out what's broken when it breaks, how to parse all the alarms so we can get it fixed quickly. Where is that on this chart? All the monitoring. Oh, that wasn't part of the handout. It's a few slides later. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hang attention. Well, as somebody who went with the aforementioned vendor back, you know, back and compliment for about 25 years, I have to say, I've actually found the process really easy. I mean, I want to pull into place that's in the shared storage, and I've got about 100. None of them are here, so I can say that we have the good students here from New York City. The, my students aren't here, but I mean, I actually have fewer maintenance issues than I had 10 years ago because of the shared storage technology, the database technology. 
And I think I can only guess that if you're working in a larger environment like a CNN type setting, that oh, I'll give you a good example. We we were bombed on 9/11. We actually lost the building. We really wanted to get the case from CBS of Lou Young on our roof, heroically reporting what happened. Well, CBS couldn't find them. I mean, they were they were lost. They were they were on tape. Um, Got to figure with a system that if you're running a man, you know, it's one little you just go in and it's there. So I would say that are we maybe making the problems too big and forgetting about all the really wonderful advantages we have? Which problems? Well, like the integration problems. I think once it's done. Well, I mean, you did something ten years ago, great, and you got it to work, and now you're sort of in the ain't, it ain't broke, don't fix it. And then there's a lot of people here that haven't quite gotten to where you are. And again, in your particular space, you own and control a lot of things that you basically get to mandate. And maybe somebody over here from CBS or NBC might disagree with you on having that level of control. And they can barely get what they need to get done in the sphere of what their problem is, let alone the guy that's in Rio trying to get a broadcast center up for the Olympics coming up. So uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Oh, I agree. So, all right. And then moving on, and Fred's going to attack me here. So, um, TLA, three letter acronym. FLA, four letter acronym. TSA, airline security. <laughs> it's this is where the buzzword conversation comes back, or how many things can you say in three letters to confuse people? And I think one of the things that started to happen or has been happening is that one, as the words and systems start moving over from the enterprise side of the IT space into the broadcast side of the IT space, we're very quick to adopt the technology terms and we're loath to actually explain what they mean. I mean, how many people here have sat in a room where somebody's throwing out soa and soap and all of those things, and I took a shower this morning, this afternoon with soap, and uh, as they, you know, we cleverly put out, Pam is my sister-in-law's name, and dam is something that prevents water from, uh, you know, coming out of the creek. And, you know, these are adorable and forget about SAN and NFS and SMB and NAS and QOS and all of that stuff. What really needs to happen, which goes to the question that was asked, is looking beyond what you're, and I think you asked the same question differently, is looking beyond the normal places that you look for information and moving on to new places of information. I was asked, um, I belong to something called the CTO Club. So it's a technical thing, but it's IT. And somebody asked me, where do you phone up on stuff? You know, if you are interested in a lot of different things, where do you go? Well, you have to go to different places. I mean, the advantage of the tools that we have accessible to us are extraordinary in that you don't have to go to a library. You don't have to buy extraordinary volumes of things. There are amazing places online that give you a question, you know, answer a question. I mean, I'm listing a couple here that I completely plagiarized. I'm really not that smart, but cut and paste is a wonderful tool. And we can do things. So when you are you want to understand what SDN is, it's not so much what it means, software defined networking. It's what does it really mean? I mean, how do you explain removing the intelligence in an Ethernet switch and moving it into a server so that as you deploy more and more switches, rather than having to replicate the profile in every one of the switches, you've got some intelligence layer that sort of sits here on the side and just kind of tells everybody what to do and lets the hardware do one thing while the application or the intelligence and to somebody else that asked about upgrading, if every time uh -oh, another switch company upgrades their uh, firmware, you don't have to run around and flash a whole bunch of switches on a whole bunch of floors, always accessible. 
you can now do it from a central location and you can do it in a non-disruptive way. So, but, and I didn't make any of that up, but I did find it in a number of different places that did a nice job explaining it. So, you know, if you take a look at this, no pride of ownership, but there are great places that you can look and find that are different than the places you've looked before to find information about what you're doing. So the same way that you look to find out about audio and video and things like that, you have to reach across the line and go to some other places to find new information and other information about um, so this is now the plug for Stimpy. Um, not really. So one of the things that is going on is that new protocols, new standards have to be adopted by the computer guys. And uh, the Cisco uh, manager was uh, very clear about saying they want to do this. Well, they are doing it. I think one of the things, and I've gotten beat up for this, but so if you don't have a switch or a router, raise your hand. <laughs> so, so how many went to Best Buy to buy it and didn't really go to CDW or Tiger Direct or direct to a manufacturer to buy it? <laughs> I mean, the real transition to IP is interesting in that it is IP, and it's been that way for a long time. Nonlinear editing, I mean, John's been doing nonlinear editing on, on the, the Dark Lord for many years. And it's all connected by a switch, and he's got storage and all of that. But as it happened, it was throw down switches, it was running to the store and just buying something that you can connect a couple of computers together, and then all of a sudden, everything is now connected and all of the technology is dependent on it and taking it apart and starting from scratch isn't one of the available options. So now what you have to do is shoehorn putting in a real stable and robust network so that it will support all of the media heavy demands that are different than a database or a word processor or something else and somebody clever many years ago said that putting in a new router was like changing the tires on a bus going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> well, this is the same thing on steroids. So we have standards coming in and we have a lot of the organizations that are trying to just make some sense out of it, interoperable, and making so that the stuff that we are doing in terms of how we connect it makes some sense. So. Uh, on the live side, simpy has got 2022 parts 5 and 6, where that is the live thing about when you're putting it over a network, that when it gets to the other side, the stuff that's coming from someplace else looks the same, video in, video out. So 2022 is video in, video out. Uh, 2059 is Genlock, just spelled differently. You know, Genlock doesn't work on an Ethernet switch. Or I haven't seen an Ethernet switch that has a Genlock hole in it. You have? Oh. Um, the same thing with uh, time code. I mean, and I'm ready to take the heat. So when we went to SDI, did we really need drop frame? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 2997 in SDI, it's kind of like the PAL and NTSC conversation going to digital? I mean, was that just a pissing contest between two companies? Probably. So now that we're in IP, what are we doing? Time code? Well, we need accurate, frame accurate time so that when you splice or stitch two things together, they don't go. Okay. I'm not going to say it's not that hard, but accurate timing across a network is not new. <coughs> and I'm sure one of the Cisco guys in here will tell you that they've been doing it for a really long time. Getting it down to frame accurate for the sensitivities of media, well, they just need to know what that is. 
I mean, they've had NTP, now we're at PTP, and 2059 is a variation of PTP, just getting it down to a little bit more finite slice. But digital one zero on off, how could we not be accurate? How could you not line up to bits? I mean, we know you can, and comically enough, from the live guys, you know, we've had master control origination is file-based with splicing and grooming for years now. So if we can do it, if we can splice and groom things, get them on the air, why can't we splice and groom things in a studio? So um, we've got a lot of efforts going on. Uh, EBU um, did a thing with uh, Belgian Television, and they actually showed it, and Grass Valley was a contributor to that. Um, so we do have standards, we do have protocols, and we are moving in the right direction. It's, again, applying knowledge from one organization or one technology space and figuring out how to make it work in another without the pre legacy technologies baggage. I'm going to get hit for that one. So, <laughs> SDI versus IP, router versus router. So SDI router is not really a router, it's a matrix switch. It started out as a crossbar switch, it doesn't do that anymore, but it's a matrix switch. An IP router is a mapping device that tells things where to go, routing it over the ether until it gets to some place where we think it belongs. Well, the SDI infrastructure is more than a router. We have things called terminal gear. We have distribution. We have reclocking. Uh, we have limits to how far something travels before you have to drop something else on the floor to get it to travel a little further. Um, if we have to go to multiple places, we've got things that do that. As we're in a transition mode, we Encode, decode, transcode, side code, up code, down code, cross convert, up convert, down convert, something convert. Um, on the IP side, we have the network. So the network is not a router. The network is both a router and a switch. But since SDI is a simplex technology, you have sources. It comes from something. You have destinations. It goes to something. In IP, it's all duplex. One wire, one piece of glass goes in both directions, but it needs a little help and knowledge about what to go and how to get there. But the ability of an IP router, and as we talked about things that start to come together, you have routing capability in switches. You don't have switching capability in routers. One could argue that one way or the other. But at the same time, the IP side infrastructure is a network. So it's not really router versus router, it's infrastructure versus infrastructure. You have SDI topology, audio video control communications. You have IP topology, audio video control communications. They coexist the same way, they coexist differently. Everybody plays together and works together. An IP fabric network would be a router in one location, satellite switches in different locations within the same environment, uh, that nice little rack of metal when you walked in, uh, with all the blinking red lights and green lights and everything, I'm sure that there's another version of that on another floor, and they get to talk to each other <laughs> through some simple connectivity that allows end devices to connect to them in a little easier way than we did in SDI. Uh, my little UN project, we had 3,000 connected devices on the network across 15 floors, and it was all done with the ability to put switches closer to the actual device is rather than running a lot of distribution and uh, equalization, the same as what we do in SDI. So the designs are different, the technology is different, the thought process is different, and the technology gives you some advantages in how it does it. And this, again, is where there's changes. But you have to integrate the two because I would say that a good percentage of your SDI devices have a little square hole in the back 
that's the manager, and that goes across the network. It's a different hall that handles the media, but you're still handling your SDI communication and control over an Ethernet network. So it's all about the network. And it's not a the network, it's networks. So contribution, there's usually a network out there. <coughs> it's a firewall, comes inside. <coughs> then we have the enterprise and the broadcast, which there's sort of to quote somebody, there's a great wall with a nice big door. <laughs> <laughs> and it allows the enterprise side and the broadcast side to talk to each other. And then when everybody agrees on what happens on the inside, it goes for the firewall and it goes for distribution. So lots of networks. And most of them are the same. They have layers within the network topology. They're all Ethernet networks. They're all configured similarly and differently. And we have wide area networks, which means that it's in different physical locations, like New York and California, not the ninth floor and the seventh floor. We have local area network, which is everything that's in this room, on this floor, and probably in the building. Um, WLAN, wireless, everybody's little Wi-Fi device. And then we have VPN, which is the annoying thing that we all know that when working from home that never works to get through the firewall so that you can get access to the network on the inside. Virtual private network, which is essentially opening up a tunnel inside a network that allows direct connections within another path. But it's all networks. That's contribution. Now, core. So the core is the broadcast facility. It's your main facility. So on the contribution side, and <laughs> typically I'm not thinking about cameras on the street, but I'm thinking about trucks, broadcast centers, uh, you know, post-broadcast facilities, things like that, where you have a collection of networks that now have to talk to another network. So we have LAN in the broadcast center. We have wireless in the broadcast center. Now what we want to do is now we want to segment it into different groups that handle audio, video, media, command and control, metadata. So now we have virtual LANs or VLANs, the ability to divide the LAN or segment the LAN into different pieces that allow you to use each piece in a controlled way without causing congestion, latency, or general problems in terms of diagnosing or figuring out why something didn't talk to something mm -hmm. else. Um, on the distribution side, more networks. It's the same Ethernet network. It's the same IP environment. You're just using them in different ways for each of the layers in the stack. So when you go from acquisition to contribution to production to delivery, it's all on a network and understanding how to configure the network from everything from QoS quality of service. So things that happen on a network that doesn't happen in SDI is we have congestion. So congestion is when we've put so much media on the network that that little command that told the playout server what the next file was didn't quite get there. Whoops. Or Something that happened on a little project I was working on, the robotic, the camera robotic system. Little bits of data, but it wants to make sure that the camera moves smoothly. So it just keeps sending it. So there we are, and all of a sudden, nothing else is going through. Media is not getting through, communication is not getting through, nothing's getting through. Why? The robotic system flooded the network. Now, put it in its own segment, and it could do whatever it wants. It works just fine. No more traffic. Interesting uh, thing in network 
congestion is KVM. You all know what KVM is? Keyboard video mouse. So I've got my server over there, I've got my screen and my keyboard over here, and mouse, and I'm doing things and I'm working everything remote. Well, what am I bringing over the network? Video. High resolution video, because I'm talking to a computer. So all of a sudden, I've got traffic on the network that's just my keyboard. I'm not doing very much, I'm moving my mouse. But I have to see what I'm doing. All of a sudden, I have network congestion. And then I did get into a altercation when somebody said that lip sync was non latency I disagreed. It was a long night. <laughs> but that's not just latency. Latency, again, goes back to if you issue a router command and it doesn't. If you issue a command to do a switch and the, the command to do the switch doesn't get there, but the media is, whoops, or you issue a command to do a switch and there's five other things that are getting in the way, that's latency. Latency is two things that have to get to the same place at the same time and, only, and one of them gets there first. So in the world of networks, you can prioritize what gets there first. So we have quality of service. How do we prioritize? What do we prioritize? Sometimes we have to do things like things called packet shaping. Packet shaping is making sure that all the different streams, data paths, play nicely together so that they have their prioritized correctly, they get the bandwidth that they want. There are lots of network settings that happen that optimize the network, but as John said, it's not completely set and forget, but once you've established the network configuration, everything tends to play nicely together, and then you just have to figure out why the application crashed. So the network is really the core of everything. Media on the network is not problematic. It's a question of configuring the network the right way that allows you to transport media, whether it's a live file, transport audio, whether it's live or file, have active communications with VoIP, and command and control, which is the tools necessary because one of the things that changes from SDI into IP is that we have many devices all working at the same time without push buttons. How many people have servers with play buttons? What? The play button. You know, the oh. button on the front that says play and stop. You know, or uh, go back, or, you know, taking it out and opening up the hood and making sure that everything works. So we have a lot of <coughs> the number of instances that you might have running on any one device requires a lot of command and control and automation to make sure that things are happening at the same time or working together. So this one is, again, as we go from SDI, so we go from coax <coughs> to a VLAN. SDI, video, now is a VLAN. Audio is a VLAN. Communications is a VLAN. It's all on the same network. It's all within the same switch. It's all going over the same path. So in change from SDI to IP, one of the things that change are we're collapsing all the different signal types all into one signal type and then putting it over the same network. So the VLAN has a fairly substantial role at the same time, network topology allows you to use a single path for all of your signals. Um, this might be getting, so you have VLANs and subnets. The control room would be a subnet. Mm -hmm. A signal would be a VLAN. What the network allows you to do is divide it through assignment so that you can make every room its own universe. Mm -hmm. At the same time, with all the provisioning that any other system has. So the studio control room has a bunch of devices. It should be its own address. Think of uh, a town and 
you have every street, and every street has a set of addresses, but each street has different addresses, but they're all in the same town. So that kind of works that way. Everybody gets the same mail, everybody gets the same water, everybody has the same electricity, but you're allowed to assign different groups so that you have different you're allowed to control traffic on the network. You're allowed to prioritize things. You're allowed to create different subgroups that make it easy to manage and easy to control. So a subnet can have many VLANs. VLANs don't have subnets. Sort of, you know, all cars are vehicles, all vehicles are not cars. So. Okay. Stars? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even breathe. No. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> Larry got it. Oh, right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. That's cheating. Stop the stars. John? Uh, John needs a microphone. This is a practical question. Uh, uh -oh. Most of us have about a 35 year old cable plan that we just keep on layering things on top of one after the other. Chainsaw. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm wondering do you think we're going to hit some stability at the physical layer where we don't really have to worry about running different kinds of physical transport? Like you can just stick with it. Like if we turn around now and say, let's go cat six, we're going to be okay for 10 years. Oh, if I said yes, I'd be lying. <laughs> but I, I mean, there's a, that's a half truth. So I think half the answer is that I would offer, and I'm willing to take heat for this, that it's going mostly fiber. So more fiber than not. And in that sense, the glass doesn't really care. So you have two flavors of fiber, you know, single mode and multi mode, and you have copper that changes based upon the demands put on a copper for short haul, but basically, you know, device to switch more times than not is copper from switch to switch and from long hauls. I mean, the nice part about uh, IP is that you can locate something pretty far away and by dropping some glass in there, like travel pretty fast. So you can do that, but I think the question is, you know, the need for copper is the question. I mean, I think I, I know there's a big push. I mean, I know that we're all waiting for uh, the manufacturers to come out with uh, wireless production switches so that we can use 5G and uh, <laughs> just do everything, uh, you know, through an access point, right? I agree with you that you have to set some priorities when you can get there, but in a full live production environment, everything has to get there once. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the need for a very strong piece of software um, to allow this to happen, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, a strong piece of software to allow all everything, to get, everything to get there at the same time. Because in a real live production environment, I mean, you can take the facilities and you have asset management and you have transport. If we're talking about live, I would think that it's not a software issue, although I think the whole conversation, it's, I mean, that's, that's the switching conversation. So that has to do with the bandwidth that the bandwidth, first of all, in terms of how much bandwidth there is uh, within the switch, how much bandwidth there is in the switch, and how you can manage the bandwidth within the switch to assure that all the things that have to get there at the same time get there. I think adding a layer of software, this is an opinion. So is adding a layer of software would only introduce latency as opposed to solving. Thank you. So Gary, just, uh, in, in a lot of the larger media companies, 
who have a lot of people in this room. Typically, the historical relationship between the IT department and the video engineering department has <laughs> been <laughs> somewhat, shall we say, prickly. <laughs> and very often, I read that in a book someplace, but I really didn't believe it. Very often, <laughs> those two departments have somewhat conflicting agendas, each of which are quite legitimate. Uh, you know, you could make an observation that probably the video engineering guys are much less concerned about security. And Not anymore. Well, uh, well, this is all, uh, this is my question. You know, the 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 video engineering guys probably tend to not know as much about setting up. Uh, huge arrays of switches and SDNs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, on the other hand, the IT guys are not at all used in general to the, the deterministic uh, kind of metrics that, that live video needs. And if a few packets drop, it's no big deal. Well, all of a sudden, it's a, it's a really big deal. How are you seeing people working that out? Is this finally the time for a convergence of those Efforts? Is it really happening? Stop smiling, George. I know you're, you're living it right now. So the answer is badly. So the answer is badly. It's happening badly. Um, I think it it varies. I mean, I, pers personal opinion. So I'm allowed to have one of those, and you're allowed to hate it. But I think realistically, you know, the IT guys decided that they could do this video thing and didn't need any help. And the broadcast guys decided they could do this IT thing, yeah. and they didn't need any help. And now we accidentally got to a place where it's one sandbox that neither one of them is acknowledging. So what we have is you've got a broadcast center that's largely a data center because it's got a whole bunch of servers in it. I literally had a video engineer tell me that, and the, the manufacturer is in the room, so I won't name him that it wasn't a server, and I should not think of it that way, it was a video server. Right? Okay, it was a white label computer with a bunch of hard drives, a motherboard, and some cards in it that did stuff. What was not about a server computer? So I think, huh? A BNC. There were no BNCs. <laughs> it was encoded somewhere else. It was purely a server doing specialized servery things, doing a really cool video thing. And I was admonished to even considering it a computer. <laughs> Whoops. The integrator on the job also told me that it was a SDI plan, not a IP design, even though we had 80 some odd servers that only job was to handle all the video and do special tricks with it. I told you what the end result was, you'd know exactly what I was talking about, so I can't do that. Um, it's, I don't know if it's evolution. I mean, it, the hard part is that there's not a lot of movement in bodies in the industry. Um, so there has to be a willingness, and I think the change management side of adoption is a top-down problem, not a bottom-up problem in that there really needs to be somebody that finally says, we're all playing the same sandbox. I mean, there's the enterprise side has very clear things that it needs to care about, and the broadcast side has very clear things that it cares about. And the network that they both live on, while it's separated by purpose, is the same network. I mean, the enterprise guys don't buy one kind of switch, and the broadcast buys buy another kind of switch. It's the same switch. It's the same router. Actually, it's controlled by the same router. It's arguably doing slightly different jobs, but for all intents and purposes, it's doing the same job. I mean, on the enterprise side, security travels on one VLAN. You know, finance travels on another, and everybody else travels on the third one. On the broadcast side, um, the UN, we had 30 VLANs. Um, it, it's a variable. It's how many you need to do what you need to do. But I think the answer is, you know, it's we have to acknowledge that why not take advantage of the knowledge on the other side of the line? And they understand networks. Why don't we explain what we want the network to do and ask them at the same time, encourage them to ask us, you know, 
about video. Do you think so you that development is happening that are organically, you know, right. encouraging, you know, engineering and IT to come well, together? Right. Or do you see just yeah, the thing that we met on, the thing that you and I met on, that little place in, in Secaucus? <laughs> uh, I, I if, if you saw any, um, you know, organic developments within the industry that are encouraging IT and video engineering to come together, what do you think? It's just purely a actually there is, there there is. There's, uh, um, Hollywood IT. Yeah, that's more. Uh, I mean, that, that's actually content based more than uh, technology based. I mean, it is. I'm involved with them. SVG does. I mean, sports video group. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, they're they're doing a lot in terms of you know trying to uh, to marry the two. I think Cynthia is. I mean, everybody's trying to do it. I think the question is just uh, everybody started out like this, and then you have and IT on one side and broadcast on the other. As we started marching to the middle, we turned around so we can have to look at each other, and now we're standing in the same sandbox, but we're back to each other, acknowledging that the other guy's there. I don't really answer to the question. It's a, it's a tough one because I mean, I, the communication schools. I was, uh, the, you know, the communication schools don't teach one way or the other. You learn communications, you typically learn production. You're not learning the technical side, and they're not marrying it with the IT knowledge that comes along for the ride. It's a hard question. And we're the tail wagging the dog. I mean, there that's a massive, massive, massive. Well, one of the best slides. And we're in a tiny little minuscule. Check this is moving my moving my video. Yeah. It's like nothing. But um, you need. What's needed is the manager with the umpire mask, in between the IT and the video folks, being able to put them at the same table get them to work out whatever issues that they have, and then make it work because we are working for the same company. That if, if you are in that environment, well, that's what I said you're, trying, yeah, you're trying to get it where uh, you're producing something that is of value to somebody and we're making money of it. And I think once you break it down to that monetary, that if you don't do this, we're not going to be around, right? Well, we're getting champions. We are. I mean, I you know, a couple of recent projects, you know, there have been some champions who have been bringing it together, and I've been in projects recently where the IT guys got it. I mean, I've, I've had two projects back to back. One, the IT guys were the villains, and the broadcast guys were the heroes. The next project, the IT guys were the heroes, and the broadcast guys were the villains. And it was pretty funny. And uh, on the IT guys being the heroes, at the top of the chain, there was a huge initiative to bring it all together. On the other side, it was interesting because there was nobody driving the bus, and then all of a sudden they brought in a new CTO who came in, just shook her head, and went, What? Really? <laughs> Could be like get in the same room and, you know, sort this out. So it really takes, and what you find, I think, which is really the interesting part, is that you have the VP of engineering of broadcast over here, and you have the CTO over there. Now, sometimes they're the same person, or they're at least sitting next to each other because it's just technology. And I think the more we acknowledge that it's, quote, just technology, the easier it is to find adoption. You know, I mean, Avid has always been a computer. Mm -hmm. It's always been a computer. You know, I mean, when we talk about where things are, I mean, I have to laugh. We're in this room talking about the basics of IP, and everybody here just wants to talk about the cloud. Like, the cloud is IP. It's a data center. It's just over there. And nobody even knows where over there is. Yes. You know, it's a big hole in Utah, or it's that funny island in the middle of the ocean that nobody knows what they're doing with it. <laughs> You know, so it's, uh, you, I mean, you're right, it, it's the hard, I mean, this stuff is easy. You know, technically, technically it's easy. Humanly? Ooh, I wouldn't even go get that. Yeah, I mean, you were right on with when the CTO, please, you're right on with when the CTO and the broadcast says you're the same. Uh, problem happens when you're not in a inherently broadcast 
um, company or if the company has migrated, like what a channel. And you've got managers, senior managers, well intentioned, but they come from other industries. And understandably, they're used to the IT guy being the technology person. And the other place where you run into problems is when you know, the, the standards that people are held to are different. Five nines, five nines, five nines. But can a broadcast engineer say, it was less than five minutes of black all year, what are you talking about? That's five nines. Well, or, you know, I mean, how many guys, how many, how many engineers in the room just have a little help desk thing where you fill out a trouble ticket and get to it the day, the day after? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So it, it was a really, I thought it was a great little uh, cartoon in the back of one of the video magazines years ago where it said, a camera goes down about three minutes before we go on the air with the nightly news. And the IT guy takes a look at it, unplugs it, reboots it, fills out a ticket, we'll get to it in three to seven days. The video guy comes in, unplugs it, rips out all the boards, takes his green, twists some things, smacks the <laughs> shit out of it, and we're back on the air 30 seconds before air. I think a lot of this cultural difference, I find us as video guys and video engineers, we lost a lot of control because we said that's IT, we don't have to deal with it, they'll deal with it. I think there's a big cultural difference, yeah, it's becoming less and less, but video guys have to react within the, the moment, within the second. We've got to keep on the air. We can't be black, we can't be down, we can't have audio breaking up, we always have to go to plan B. What are we going to do? What are we going to patch? And I think a lot of times the IT guys are like, yeah, you know, uh, we'll get to it. We got to look at that. We got to fill a service, and you know what? We're going to fix it in the next revision, which we're actually going to charge you for. So if you're going to spend uh, five minutes, or, you know, thousand dollars on this, or you know, to buy a car, which you don't want, but if you give us, you buy the next car, or you you pay for the upgrade, we'll fix it. And I think there's a big, you know, cultural difference. Now, so you just said, so, okay, so what you just said? Yeah. So. I won't call them out on it, but there's probably more than one manufacturer in the room. Probably each of them make software-based technology, and sometimes there's a bug. They fix it no. in the next yeah. <laughs> but that, but then they fix it in the next revision. But, that, but so that's really the, the, the mindset <laughs> of, I think, of software IT versus you know, hardware, I've got to get this thing to work in place. Well, but unfortunately, I think the reality <laughs> is that we're at, you know, we're there. You know, the cameras, the computer. We all, we all have different elements, but I think it's right on when it says that both teams work for the same company. And they're all have related one thing. But that's just a rumor. I don't think everybody can that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know your name. Osvaldo. Yeah. So you're Osvaldo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's right. I think we're, we're working for the same, we have two different teams working for the same owner. And the bottom line is that we all have to make it work, otherwise we're all out, both of them, both sides of it, except for the manager bringing both teams together to make it happen. Well, uh, it's, it's a lot of companies that go into project yeah. managers because they are not either ABs or IT, IT so they can bring the team together and it goes, you're right, you're wrong, can you work this out? What are the differences in the And the companies are having a hard time because typically IT fell on the finance. Because the only thing that mattered was yeah. whether or not you were making so money or losing money. Who the LP and now all of a sudden everything was. Excuse me? Yeah. The only people who know who the LP <laughs> I love this slide. And when I showed it to everybody, they said, well, what does it mean? So I had to make up an answer. <laughs> so I think the answer I made up is that content delivery is all about the user experience. And the entire conversation of everything we're talking about here is making sure that the content that gets created meets the user's expectation because otherwise we're a lot of so it's really about, in the world of IT, it's all about getting content in new and different ways. The SVG guys love to talk about telling a story. I'm sure that everybody uses the same thing in different ways. And we have different ways of getting it there. We have over the top, over the air, under the 
It's a tablet. It is a phablet. It is a Roku. Chromecast just came out with a new little stick that you can do something with. John. Uh, Gary, I, I just have to give a shout out to the people in this room and have them just reevaluate their relationship with their IT people. Um, most of the people here are running more storage and higher bandwidth networks than their IT people are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that's just intimidating. <laughs> well, yeah. But, but I think you have to put it in perspective. I mean, I built the first local area network at City College. You were there. Because, you know, they, I mean, it's, it's crazy. We have, we have, we have more bandwidth better quality of service, bigger storage, you know, than, than the IT people. But they have something we don't have, which is they can lie better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to say so. Oh, well, yeah. no, no. <laughs> you do remember Y2K, and you do remember airplanes were not going to fall out of the sky, and elevators were not going to I was right. 12, and I really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> So I think one of the things that we have to work on, I mean, I hate to say it, I think one of the things we have to work on, I think this is a great presentation, but I think we have to work more on our social capital because we actually are better technologists than the IT people on, a, on any given day. I mean, I was, kind of, I, I was just given the job. I would no, no, probably no. challenge that in a different forum. In a different forum, sure. Well, <laughs> we're in this so I should shut up. But. <laughs> no, it's not even that. I mean, you know, I mean, when was the last time you built a transactional web service? Actually, I built the first web server at the college, but not server. Yeah. Service. Service. Transactional web service. And they took it away from me by that point because they knew they had social capital. Right. Yeah, cool. So, but, you but know, I think. Gary, I want to think about that because it is important. Like, I think we tend to. I think in general, the 50 people overall and and the membership overall tend to underestimate their actual technical knowledge. And okay. Kudos, everybody. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Gary, I had a question. Hold on. Oh, sorry. We've talked about networking and the IT side being very similar to the broadcast side. And yet, I've seen presentations where we've talked about SDN, software defined networks, where we're actually taking routers and people are hacking raw code, dumping it in it redefining how the router is actually going to work. That and came from the IT guys. That came from the IT guys? Yep. I was just wondering what your perspective was on that. I mean, oh, I are we going there? We're back to back. Somebody's actually making this stuff and yeah. the code will converge? Where are those guys? They're probably sitting in the back. <laughs> Talk about it. The Cisco guys. Hmm. It's, again, yes, you know, right. first of all, so the challenge is, and I'm going back to buzzwords, so somewhere along the line, the broadcast guys pick up a buzzword, they start throwing it in, everybody's doing it, and they acknowledge like they've been doing it for their entire lives, while the place that it came from is still trying to figure out whether or not what they're going to do with it, how they're going to do it. It is the future, but it's not quite mature or robust yet. So for the fine networking sort of falls into that because it came out of, and I was telling somebody the story earlier, so uh, at the UN, the physical... SDI router was 1200 by 1500. The virtual router, with all the stuff that you can do, was 5000 by 7000. It was a big database. All of this virtual cross pointy stuff, which used to be called salvos and macros, but we found new words, so we call them virtual cross points. Um, the manufacturer learned the hard way that. The server that was driving all of that was a little underpowered. Oops. I hate when that happens. Don't you hate when that happens? I hate when that happens. Well, it took a little while, but all of a sudden, you know, they figured it out, and now they have to retrofit a server. Well, it's not taking the router out and putting a new router back in. It's lifting a little top piece off and putting a new little top piece in, and it's probably more software than hardware and it will start to work, SDN, software-defined networking. So, you know, as, as network requirements start to get very complicated and difficult, the amount of horsepower that you need isn't practical to build into a switch, and then the first time there's an upgrade, 
you're having to, you know, burn new firmware into the switch in a disruptive way, as opposed to, you know, having it in something that, you know, can be updated and upgraded and managed in a non-disruptive way that provides a little bit more horsepower. But the, the answer is, it started in the IT space. You know, I mean, somebody, you know, in last January, somebody had a great slide. It was a little hack me, a uh, little uh, thing that showed broadcast industry is this big and the yeah. IT industry yeah, is this John big. Maya. So guess what? I mean, we're adopting the technology. I mean, do you think Dell made a video server first? I mean, realistically? You know, I mean, <coughs> how your uh, switcher, you know, control surface talks to a server over there. Do you think they invented that server? I mean, you know, we have all of this, you know, we watch replays on TV and all kinds of very exotic things. They're computers. No, they're Dell, they're IBM, they're HPs, they're white labels, they're all kinds of things. It's computers. You think they were invented just in video? No, we're using commodity-based software. We're using the technologies and the advancements in technologies that came over from the IT side, and we're just taking it and doing things with it that they just never imagined. Mm. And now the conversation really is how do you bring them along? If you're willing to use the technology, why aren't we willing to use the knowledge? I mean, why learn about QoS when you have somebody that knows it? Why don't you just explain what you need it to do and have them work with you on doing it probably faster and more efficiently than it will for you to learn, you know, network topology and how many things you can break before you get it to work right now. You know? I mean, the same thing. I mean, Skype just said that they're going to go 4K. Meanwhile, they're out for eight hours on Monday, and nobody blinked. Yeah. There's, there's also something to add to that. Uh, the knowledge base, so SOA by itself, just dive deep into it, and an API dive deep into it, and basically you, you have a specialty there. We broadcasters are generalists. We don't have the time to dive deep into those things, but as you said, the having a good relationship with an IT space can bring those specialists along to help you answer those questions to see if you can leverage it. But if the manufacturer really brings that technology along, you just have to figure out, can you, do you need to learn it, or are you then at the mercy of that vendor which has a tool, which has configuration. Well, you can learn has, along the way. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, you know, one of the, you, can, you know, as why not go to school on the person who's doing it and decide how much of it you have to know versus, uh, you know, how much you just need to know who knows it. You know, jump around. Drop around. So I'm not going to really get crazy here because we all know what asset management is. We're all experts at it. You know, Pam, Sam, ma'am, all of that stuff, you know. So I'm going to so what the comedy is, not really. So I'm not going to get too crazy, but it's really about how we handle the meeting. And again, it's server-based, but at the same time, it has to move. So, you know, have we take a we encode to make a file, or we're accidentally going to not have to encode anymore. We're just going to have files. Okay, fine. So it gets registered because we all know that as soon as you start working on something, somebody's sitting there typing away, they're logging, they're putting in all this useful and rich information, so that when somebody goes to look for it, they know exactly how to find it. Uh, no, no. Okay. Um, so. You know, asset management is New York State owns, I think I was told, somewhere in the vicinity of 30,000 dump trucks. And they really need to know which garages they're in because when it snows, they've got to move them around. And those are assets. And asset management is what garage is that truck in? Okay. So media is <laughs> about what we do with our content 
and I think there are different asset management systems. So uh, it's not so much the words. So production asset management is Interplay and ISIS. Then they bought Blue Water, so now media asset management is still Interplay, but it's just spelled differently. It's spelled the same. It does think different things. Um, Gillette is an asset manager. It does things, but they're a around the production asset manager. They're not the production asset manager. And then we use different tools for getting it in, in the middle, and getting it out. And one of the things that all asset managers do is talk to each other. <laughs> oh, no. Really? Damn. So tighter integration with other systems. What do we do with an asset? How do we manage it? How do we keep it moving on? And then, this is great. We hate the enterprise people. We don't talk to them. They're not our friends. But the legal guy really needs access to the asset management system because he's the guy that controls rights management and he's the guy that tells the system what it's allowed to do and what it's not allowed to do. The finance guy, he's the guy that makes it an asset. He puts a value on it. He also wants to know how big the inventory is what they're charging for it. All of that gets embedded into the asset system. And going back to, if you weren't sleeping, to talk about the network. So on the enterprise side of the world, somebody's got their little QuickBooks program. And uh, you know, I'm a lawyer.com, open up on their screen. And it's got to go all the way through the network on, through the enterprise, jump over the great moat with the two nice doors into the broadcast land and all of a sudden into the asset manager so that they can talk to it at the same time without having all of that traffic go back the other way, but traffic and scheduling, enterprise, automation and orchestration, broadcast, marketing business intelligence, enterprise, post-production graphics, broadcast, studio production, broadcast, review and approve, enterprise, oops, Okay, so now we're going to get those proxy things all the way on the other side and make sure that it's just the proxy. And a proxy is not DNX 145. Mm -hmm. Proxy is a little things. Legal DRM, enterprise. Enterprise is enterprise. Billing enterprise, library and archive, both sides. Search and browse, both sides. So the interconnection between enterprise and broadcast is there. So there is kind of some compelling reasons to play nicely. And, uh, metadata, 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 metadata. <laughs> so, all right, so who's paying attention? So we have taxonomy, which is the cataloging of stuff. We have ontology, which is grouping <laughs> it all together. Okay. And then I wear contacts. Got to give a look. Okay. Um, metadata, data about data. Stupid. Information about information. Okay, well that clears up the data about data thing. So, and now we have big data, which is not to be confused with little data. So little data is probably this PowerPoint slide. Big data. There's a lot of PowerPoint. So, are there standards? Yes, there are. So, the Dublin Core is not an Irish apple. <laughs> and Dublin, Ohio is actually that Dublin. And it was a meeting of library scientists who thought that maybe having one set of standards so you could find things, by the way, the Dewey Decimal System is metadata. Um, so they came up with 15 fields that would define everything you ever needed in an archive. EBU did not agree. No. The first time around they thought 60 would work. Well, then they went away and they came back and they said 80 would work. But then, you know, that's on the other side of the pond. So when we have to do something here, you can't really listen to what they do. So 
PBS was putting together an asset management system. So they came out with PB Core 1.0. Now we have 2.0. And if you go to pbcore2.0.com, you will find the way big list of metadata fields. But the Library of Congress felt that 800 unique fields were going to be the bare minimum in their system before they could actually find something. And then we'll place it on the stars. Apple Core is literally the core of Apple. <laughs> <laughs> so my little genie guy, um, that's how I find stuff because, I mean, nobody has a file on their computer that says IMG001, do they? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so a contextual search is typing anything you want, hoping for the best. You know, all of those people that put in all that rich metadata now let you find it because it's an unstructured search that allows you to look for something in an unstructured way. A faceted search is when you go on open table and you can pick how much you want to spend and the region you want it to be in and all of those good things. That's a faceted search because it filters it down and theoretically with all the fields filled in, you can actually distill down into a query set where how you want to find things. Now we have the semantic search. I'm smarter than you. Artificial intelligence. So not only can you ask, but it knows what you didn't ask. And through divine inspiration of artificial intelligence, it guesses what you really meant. So with contextual and semantic, you always get exactly what you want or not. I have a friend here who's laughing because he does. People who don't put the data, the metadata in adequately. <laughs> Uh, I'm more concerned because of the uh, people who don't enter the metadata accurately and completely, which makes everything fail. So, my little genie guy um, will scream into a finish. Uh, John loves to talk about storage, and we have lots of storage, so storage is removable stuff that we keep in our pocket, and when you empty your pockets at home, there's chips and cards and all those things that really should have been in the edit room that we didn't transfer. Um, we have high availability storage, which is the real fast stuff when you're doing meltdowns. We have near line because it's three days old and nobody cares about it. And then we have offline, that's the shelf in somebody's office that they took it out of the robot because there was not enough room because the near line was occupying too much space. So storage is, uh, and then we have cloud storage. So how many people are putting their uh, ProRes 220 up in the cloud? Ooh, really? DNX 145? Uh, do I hear proxies? Sure. Yeah, and take four. <laughs> I do know the Weather Channel is planning to go to the cloud. <laughs> so Weather <laughs> Channel. It's Africa. <laughs> so, again, you know, it's really how you make a decision, not what the decision is. So, where do you keep it? What do you keep it on? How long do I keep it? You know, you have to think about retention. How important is it for how long? You know, do we save it forever? Yeah, sometimes. Do we save it in high availability forever? Not so much. And then more acronyms. So, Again, you know, just throwing them out there, not to explain, but to identify for uh, looking forward. And we talked about this already, so I don't have to spend a lot of time, but, you know, integrating everything across the network, across systems. Um, we have different things that do that job. XML and JSON are uh, software tools that create commonality between systems. However, 
Uh, XML is a language, and all XML is not created equal. All databases are not created equal. So it's just a matter of uh, understanding a little bit more about data, but as William said, you know, do I have to know all that stuff? No. I have to know somebody who knows that stuff. It's good to have a database guy, and they can help you with that. So, I have a standard TV core. I should have given it to the Apple Corps guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's time to take pot shots. I'm getting tossed. No, I'm at least good still being here since I was asked the question. So, I mean, I think this is the one that everybody likes. Tim. Oh, I'm sorry, you thought I had a question. So, the engineering question is, here we go. So, in SDI, how useful is a waveform vector scope? Yeah, not so much. So then we went to uh, gamut and jitter and all kinds of other things that make much prettier pictures on scopes. It's scopes on color, so nice. And how useful is that in IP? Uh, not so much. So in learning new things, and again, I think this is probably where commonality exists. So we have applications, programs, that do things like look at bit rate or bit rate error or checksum. Does, was the file corrupt? Can I open it again? Does the file have all the stuff in it? Um, is there an error on the network that is causing the packets to not appear correctly that when they get to the other side, they don't really reassemble themselves and anything that vaguely resembles any kind of media content. There are new tools. And I think one of the things that you asked in, in adoption is we need to adopt the new tools. Uh, looking at a waveform monitor it tells you nothing about what's going on in a camera <laughs> or an outbound path. Uh, a bit rate analyzer or packet loss detector or a file checker will do those things. So I think we need to be more adoptive in terms of the new technologies, in terms of analyzing what we're doing, and learn a little bit more about how those things work. So that could be left. That's where an application would make a big difference and do make a big difference. So, yeah. We're monitoring different things. We're using different tools. So we're there. So I got to do this because how could we not do clouds? So this was great. I stole it. No pride of ownership. How do you explain the cloud? Pizza as a service. <laughs> so, if I make it all at home, my table's at home, the soda's at home, the oven's at home, everything's at home. If I'm doing take and bake, then the dough, the tomato sauce, the cheese, the pepperoni on the outside, and the tools to cook it are on the inside. Uh, delivery. Delivery, they bake it, do all the stuff with it, have all the ingredients, and the only thing I have to do is have a place for them to put it. And then, you know, we're just going out to dinner. So, <laughs> it's all outside. So, now, if we translate that a little bit, so I have my on-premise everything. So applications, data, OSs, middleware, all the good stuff is in that little glass lined room out on the outside. And I don't need anybody else. It's all here. Well, maybe that's okay, but now I want to see if there's some stuff that I can like push off to a data center somebody else's data center, not mine, because I don't really want to keep buying that iron. 
So I'm going to take the hard stuff and I'm going to put it someplace else, but I'm going to keep the soft stuff. So the applications, the data, because I own that and that has value. Runtime, which is the core of the OS and everything that, you know, this is one of those IT things, you know, when you take stuff from IT guys, they put things like runtime in there. And middleware and OS, but the servers, the storage, and the networking is somebody else's problem. Okay, well, what's the next step after that? So the next step after that is applications mine, data mine, everything else I rent. So package software we own, infrastructure, hardware out, software in, platform, everything out, my data, <coughs> my applications, and then software as a service, rent the whole thing. So software as a service, Office 365, <coughs> so Office as a service, Google Docs, software as a service. Salesforce.com made software as a service. So as long as, if, if all you're doing is using a connection and what's old is new, so somewhere a long time ago in the early days of computer, and there's no one in this room that would remember that, <laughs> they had things called terminals and a mainframe. Mm -hmm. And the terminal was a screen and a keyboard, and somewhere we have no idea where, because they didn't have cloud then, it was a big box the spinning wheels that did computing. We don't have that anymore. Now we have a web screen and a mouse and a keyboard and it's connected over magic to somewhere else. To a data center. But there's a server doing magic -y stuff. But it allows so in SDI everything when the amortization was done, when the depreciation was done, or it broke beyond repair, we bought a new one, and it was always iron, iron, iron. In the IP world, you can rent that, and through big pipes or little pipes, or oh, we don't dial up anymore, um, you can actually offload all of that, and for all intents and purposes, keep it as a operating expense and something that you manage remotely as opposed to having big rooms of big iron. So, but the cloud has its limits, I would say, in broadcast. And I think we're not there yet. I mean, I know that we're threatening, you know, 10 gig and 40 gig and 100 gig, but I think until we get to practical application, you know, trying to keep big media in a remote location is not quite practical quite yet, but we're moving there. And I think the use of the cloud is still evolutionary in broadcast. So I'll ask one more question. So <laughs> Last one. Is the, the last one. Mm -hmm. We have two winners. Book. We have one book. Two winners. Two winners. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> one book. All right. So that's it.